and welcome to New Game Plus. I'm Tim, I'm joined by Donald, how are you? I should be asking you that question, Tim, because I think yours is the more pertinent thing given that we have just passed a weekend full of gaming, esports e gaming prominence in Australia, what with the Crown International. Yes, the Crown International CSGO tournament, $555,000 on the line, yeah. uh, and an Australian team came second. They did very well. They were, I think, 450 outside odds of winning. And they advanced to the grand final, which was mm -hmm. amazing for Australian esports. They went up against one of the best teams in the world, Team Virtus Pro. Unfortunately, they did lose, but it was live on Fox Sports 1 to uh, the dismay yeah. of some of the general public. <laughs> Cricketers and general what's called Twitterers, they talk to their, they talk to their Twitter accounts to express their, let's say, disinterest in the fact that, that digital sports were being broadcast in place of yes. golf. Digital sports. But it's a big thing. Uh, just recently, before filming, uh, $100 million is being invested into Team Virtus Pro yeah. from the richest men in Russia. So expect lots of uh, Russian esports to be <laughs> happening very soon. Oh, you mean even more than what's going on right now? Yes. Oh, my stars. But uh, I'm very excited for Australian esports. With mm. Hopefully it was a big success for Crown, for Fox Sports, for ESL in Australia. Not and to mention, they do more yeah, things like this. Not to mention, like it, like it just continues the narrative of the Australian teams being, well, the underdogs, but doing surprisingly well, like the Renegades doing exceptionally well at one of the la um, last recent majors. Yes. And now you have um, What's Up Team Immunity doing so well, lo so locally. Yeah, it's great to see that uh, not necessarily uh, teams that are salaried full times for this sort of stuff actually winning and getting some prize money. Mm. But we do have an episode for this week, so we are having a look at the NES. It's 30 years old yes. this week, so get excited for that. We also have... We also have LEGO Dimensions, our little toy, new entry in the Toys to Life genre. Let's see how it goes later this episode. But first up, Shovel Knight. So Shane, let's talk about Shovel Knight. It was a Kickstarter game in 2013, mm -hmm. came out last year, yep. got ported to PlayStation and Xbox platforms this year, yep. as well as finally being out on the Wii U and 3DS in Australia this year. Yep. And it's the first true, proper third-party Amiibo. Plus, we're also getting a retail release. Yeah, so I figured that, well, maybe we should talk about Shovel Knight now? I guess so. Basically, it's a retro-inspired game where the con core concepts are you're a shovel, or no, you're a knight with a shovel, not a, not, not a shovel with a knight. That would be very confusing. It's slightly confusing, but you're a knight with a shovel, and that's your weapon. So you hit people with your shovel, you dive people people down with your shovel. Like, fix, you just fix, use everything. Fix with you. Yeah. yeah. It's like, what? Mega Man, Castlevania, and then what, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah it takes a lot from kind of the classic 8-bit games that were notoriously difficult, the kind of guys you see on people YouTube just ra you know, raging about. Mm. But it's not that bad about it, like it's a, it's a game with those ideas and aesthetics in mind, but it's easier, it's more approachable for, the modern, for, a modern kind of, for a modern kind of gaming aspect. But that's one thing I don't really enjoy too much, because sometimes it just feels a little bit too easy. There are ways you can, I guess, add difficulty yourself. There's New Game Plus mm. mode, you can destroy checkpoints for money. But I just, like, the bosses are just a little bit too easy. There are strategies there to be done, but you right. don't need to do them because you can just damage boost through it's everything. It's still fun though. I mean, it's, and, it's, it's and the soundtrack's great. The soundtrack is probably one of the best mm. things about this game because it takes some great elements from like the retro inspired music and then just adds such like just a little bit more finesse than the others did and just, oh, it's amazing. So I guess what we're saying is, I mean, we recommend it. I mean, it's out on everything, so yeah. <laughs> Shane, do you like a good board game? I do like a good board game. What if that board game were digital? A digital board game, you say? Yeah, or a digital board game made in Australia. Ooh. Because from League of Geeks, we have Armello, and it's a, it's a very fantasy-themed board game, like most board games, really. You have a king in the middle who has been corrupted, and you your goal is to take down that king and overthrow him, basically. And there's, I guess, multiple ways to do this. There's the kill the king, basically. Yeah. There's the save the king. There's the be more evil than the king. And there's the 
Be nice to the king because you will be king if you are nice to the king. Because you have magical stones that make you ultra really nice. Yeah. But there are four ways to win. However, the game is very much leans towards the prestige or the king slayer victory mm. form. It's hard to get harder to get the other two. Not impossible, but you need a lot of luck going your way. And as you'd expect from a board game, there is a lot of RNG, a lot of literal mm. die rolls here. And, but that's not a bad thing. It does take away, I guess some of the skill but yeah. there's enough like balance between the characters in that some are very combat based yeah. and have more dices to roll during combat some are more movement based some are more i guess trap based mm. there's a really nice balance here with all the characters and I actually didn't mind, I guess, how much RNG was involved because... Even when you throw in the cards that could throw in a wild card, you might just get an OP card or something like that, which I often got. Yeah, you do get that, but you actually have to work your way to that. You yeah. have to actually do, like, either a quest or go to a specific spot, and that's almost working away from your own objective. Like, yeah. it balances its way in the sense that if you're doing something else, you are risking more because mm. there's more less uh, reward, I guess, in a sense, and a lot more risk. So as a board game, it's fine if a little bit imbalanced, but as a digital thing though, it's well presented at the very mm. least, isn't it? Good it's music, good visuals. It's a very beautiful game. Mm. It's one of those things that I think you might want to actually be playing with friends though, yeah. because you just lose something from a board game playing against AI yeah, or just, just random you people. You just can't stare your opponent in the face. But in the end, Armello, as a digital board game, it's certainly ch it's got its uh, delights for sure, but it's lacking in one or two things. Well, this week, the nest turns 30 years old. So not the Famicom, <coughs> which was produced a couple of years before that, but the remade version that was made for the US market. So it sold 62 million units in worldwide. It was made, manufactured from 85 to 95 in the US and a bit longer in Japan, like about seven years longer. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah I was uh, about 10 years in America and about 20 years in Japan. And yeah. It only stopped when they ran out of parts. Yes. Um, <laughs> which is going to be good. 3D printing is going to help that up, help yeah. that a lot. So uh, that's a big that change we'll be looking forward yeah. to for retro consoles. But that's another story. Um, now, the, uh, the this, this little unit, we also had a particular design feature that we haven't really so seen yeah, since. So, the, yeah, the Famicom came with a, a top-loading cartridge slot and a disc slot and a card slot and all sorts of things. But this version was remade for US audiences so you could stick it in your entertainment unit and and it would sit beside your VCR and and operate like a VCR yeah, that's pretty nice no, loading I'm surprised it hasn't happened more because sometimes I look at consoles and I think why don't they look like they fit in an entertainment unit yeah, yeah they're always uh, curved and everything uh, so but then again that, that stopped after that but, yes uh, it's a nice design thing um, but but some of the things that they really did with the uh, the nest was um, now they just come out of the Crash. Video game crash of '83, where um, Atari went downhill real quickly with the sale of ET, um, the famous story that they were buried in a Nevada desert, actually turned out to be true. Uh, good video if you can find that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, but um, Nintendo's response to that was to try and have stricter controls. So. Yeah. So some of the controls I had was that if you wanted to make a game for the NES, you had to buy the cartridges off them. Um, as a third-party developer, you were only allowed to be signed to Nintendo. You couldn't make games for any other company. And if you were developing games for them, you could only develop five a year. So you didn't have a dominance over Nintendo themselves or any other company. Well, they would never have seen Assassin's Creed on the Nintendo no, no, system. No, no. Or COD. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and they had their Scylla, Scylla quality. Now, the, um, we've got here the... Yes. That, that's that's saw its way into almost every Nintendo console since, didn't it? Yeah, the Nintendo seal of quality. But um, the seal of quality also pertained to the art. Uh, yes, one of the big complaints of uh, of games, um, and it still happened on PC games, was that the pictures shown on the box had nothing to do with the game. Yes. <laughs> so, not even remotely close. So they showed movie quality graphics on, yep. on the front of the box and play the game on the Atari and it was a bunch of lines and vectors. And so this one actually shows you what the game looks like. And that was one of the big complaints people had before Crash. And also varying quality of games across consoles was yes. another thing people were, were upset about. Now, um, there's Nintendo are one of two companies that made major changes to uh, controller designs. Um, yes. So this is the controller for the NES. Um, it was one of the first controllers, oh, like game pads, sorry, for a console-based system because um, all the others before that had paddles, wheels, or joysticks, joysticks mm. were being the most popular. The Atari style ones, yes. Yeah, 
So um, yeah, this was a major redesign for console, the console market. And eventually this got rounder during the NES's lifetime, turned into the basically a SNES style um, controller. But, every one and since every then. controller since then has that same kind of design, the D-pad, the start select button and yep. the major button. And the big change after was Sony adding the dual, the dual uh, thumbsticks. Panel, yeah. um, but uh, that, that was based on the Game of Watch, wasn't it? The, uh, yes. The controllers from there. Um, and also, it wasn't as concerned that it could be stepped on, so this being flat means it uh, was and very more, durable. And more kid-friendly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, kid friendly. Now that's the other thing Nintendo uh, did. Yes. <laughs> so. so most of their games were censored in some way. Um, not censored. They had strict controls <coughs> of what can appear on their system. So there was no violence. There was no blood. That kind of thing. And that's maintained all through Nintendo's um, lifespan, really. Yeah. Well, well, actually, they. I think they relaxed a little bit on Wii when they had a few games that uh, got a little bit more edgy. But uh, and there'd be a few people now that'd be quite welcome that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sort of change, but. Uh, um, now, uh, now the games on on the the NES. Now we're, we're now this are just. I mean, there's kind of like two stages of video game consoles: pre-crash, post-crash, and post-crash. We saw the introduction on this console of really some of the biggest. Some of the biggest franchises out there. Yeah. Um, so Super Mario Brothers. Well, yes. Yes. The three Super Mario. The Brothers, juggernaut yeah. that is Super Mario is something that is unstoppable. Um, we also have things like Metroid. Legend of Zelda first appeared on the NES. Yep. Um, my favourite, Castlevania, <laughs> first yes. appeared on the NES. Uh, Metal uh, Gear. Another Konami game, Metal yep. Gear. So not Metal Gear Solid, because he wasn't 3D, but Metal yep. Gear appeared so on the NES. franchise, yep. Um, Contra, another Konami game. And also things like, you know, Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior, and it's now called Dragon Quest. Yep. So Final Fantasy was made by Square, Dragon Warrior was made by Enix, and now they've merged and the whole franchise has continued and mm. Dragon Quest game got released and, the other day. And Mega Man as well. So, so this Mega Man, like <laughs> Capcom, that's a huge franchise as well. So from the console side, this is kind of the console that, that really just got things kick-started after the crash, wasn't it? Yeah. So on the computer side, you had the 64 and that, but on, on the console side, this is, a, this is a little thing that got it going. It had no competitors at the time. The Sega Master System tried to, but it fell short by about you know a tenth of the sales. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. 62 million of these got sold. That's a lot of that's a lot of consoles back then when gaming wasn't as big as it is now. Remember, I mean, 62 yeah. million consoles um, pre the the explosion of gaming in the last few years. That's a, that's a lot. That is a lot. Yeah. And so, yeah, the NES will be remembered for a long more lot more years further to come for the legacy it's left the video game industry. So, 30 years of the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, I think you were excited as I was when we saw the little bits of Battlefront 3, but yep. now it's out and it's not from who we, we were expecting. Yeah, so uh, Free Radical have uh, got given the boot many, many years ago. We saw what they, were, uh, what they had to offer, but instead, DICE have come in instead. Yes, so now we have Star Wars Battlefront EA presented by EA Battlefront 3. Sponsored uh, by PepsiCo. <laughs> yes. Uh, and it certainly does feel like a dice game because when you're in the first person mode it does feel like you're playing Battlefield. The Battlefront 2 was a third person mm -hmm. more experience. Uh, in this game, not so much. It's kind of flipped it on the side a bit yeah. where the third person view feels very janky compared to Battlefront or the first two Battlefront games and instead the first person view is very optimal. Yeah, so we got to try out the beta uh, along with a lot of other people that tried out the open beta and only the first two maps were available but we got a good feel for those two maps. Yeah, so the, the first map in particular is a bit more close quarters where you need to obtain pods with power-ups in yep. them gives you incentive to you know to, to play as a team all that sort of stuff and then the other one in particular which is hoth where you play with the bigger toys in the vehicles yes the walker assault which it is called uh there were some balance issues but they'll fix that at release but the overall feel of the game what are we thinking i'm gonna say uh jaws was never my scene and no i do not like the state of star wars battlefront beta at the moment uh everything from the balancing of the weapons the weapon diversity is an absolute shambles Hope you've, hopefully you like blasters and nothing else because you get nothing like Wookiee Bowcasters or snipers in the game. There's absolutely no diversity whatsoever and I'm getting sick of using blasters all the damn time because it's just so easy to pick off opponents. Seems very limited and from such a diverse universe that they have, they yep. could certainly bring in more. Hopefully they see a lot of the feedback that's coming from the beta and really make a better product because yep. I'm not sure if the remaining maps and game modes that they have will 
really make for a good experience. They're trickling them out, but I mean, it's almost a month away from develop uh, from from release, and they would have wrapped up development by now. So, fingers crossed. But outlook not so good. So close, Far Cry. You could have avoided the Ubisoft trap of being some annualized franchise, but no, you have just you are just shy of being annualized with what 15 months between the release of Far Cry 4 and Far Cry Primal. But uh... I think it started to go that way as soon as Far Cry 4 came out. Yeah, when the the distance between Far Cry 3 and Far Cry 4 wasn't that much especially, and the differences between especially them. Especially when you throw into account Blood Dragon as well, the exceptionally terribly <laughs> written Far Cry um, expansion. Oh my goodness, I cannot... There is not enough time in the world for me to elaborate on the slapshot laziness of the references of that game's 80s nostalgia. <laughs> Now, let's just talk about the game, because... Far yes, Cry Far Cry Primal. Blood Dragon was terrible, but Primal. Primal. It's, it's an odd setting. It seems to be just changing the yeah. setting, much like the Assassin's Creed game to yeah. games to our like, disappointment, but we, we'll see what they can do with that time period. Hey, let's upgrade our spear to another spear. Yeah, uh, it's certainly going to be different to uh, the other Far Cry games and it's like what no. drug trips are they going to have in yeah. prehistoric How, What, what tower humanity? is they going to climb this time? How are you going to get rocks, pull them out of your arm or whatever and it zoom out and it turns out it's all in Abstergo. It's in the same universe as Assassin's Creed. I'm still looking a bit forward to a very violent Ice Age. I was aware, I heard about this magical video game that combines the Lego Movie, The Simpsons, Jurassic World, uh, Lego Kima, Scooby-Doo, Ghostbusters, Doctor Portal, Who, Portal, Doctor Who, essentially any sort of licensed brand you can think of, and it's I all thought, in Lego Dimensions, the latest game from Warner Brothers and Tra Traveller's Tales game. Sounds like, it sounds incredible, like what is Lego Dimensions? It is. Lego. Okay. It is it is a Travel Tales Lego game, okay, but like with those. more pop culture references and the and the figurines, which is probably the most distinctive elements of this game. So basically, this is a Lego game mixed in with Toys to Life. Because we have here, we have Gandalf, who's kind of missing his head, his hat, but still they can't see that on the camera. But yes, we it, it, it has it has all sorts of um what's it called of mini figs that you can build in real life and then implement in the game, like you would your Toys to Life games. And indeed. It's this physicality which is probably the best thing that LEGO Dimensions has going for it because the portal that you see, that you use in the game, you have to build it. As you get your basic okay. base, but you have to you have to what, get the LEGOs out and you have to go through the assembly instruction booklet and then build it your own gosh darn self. Same with all the vehicles. So, and 
the physicality continues on from there. Regularly during the game, to solve the puzzles, you have to move your characters around on the various segments of the portal. That sounds kind of distracting. It though. would, in theory, but in practice, it just it ties you to the game a lot more. As in, and the USB cable is long enough so that you can actually have it sitting next to you the entire time. Right, right, right. So... I guess in that case, it's probably it's be the best of both worlds. Like, it seems like a decent toy to life game, but what about the actual gameplay? The actual gameplay is probably the part I liked least about the game because it is barely stock standard Traveler's Tales Lego game in that you're running around destroying environments to essentially get Lego pieces so that you can construct the, um, the cure to the obstacle and move on and on. You have fairly rote boss battles, the puzzles become formulaic after a, a short time and right. the game just abides by the rule of three so hard and that like due to this formulaic aspect it even at eight to ten hours long it overstays its welcome. But, but I can have Doctor Who and Homer Simpson team up but it's, that has to be like the greatest game ever to like five people out of there. Yeah, to those five people, yes. And that's the thing about the game, it also deals with the pop culture references, the mashups, it deals with that fairly well because we are talking about um, Traveller's Tales here so mm -hmm. the writers crew they are they have that sort of family comedy sort of sensibilities to them you can imagine the act voice actors who are all top tier by the way you can imagine them doing the DreamWorks Merc the entire time oh, but fantastic. it's still it's it's still clever-ish writing I guess it wasn't completely cringe inducing so in that case then if you're it sounds like okay I, I like look I like Toys to Life I like the Lego games would you recommend it after all this? You like Lego games, so yes, this will be a good. It's a good entry into the toys to entry genre. It's still very much the first entry in a long franchise. What will be a long franchise? Oh yes. I dislike the Lego the Lego gameplay of it, the formulaic aspect. But otherwise, it is still a solidly presented title. It's got Homer Simpson. So yet another figurine sort of game. Yep. Are Lego too late to the party? Yeah, they kind of are, because we've got a long established market uh, with these um, Toy to Life games. And currently at the King is Nintendo with their Amiibo, specifically with the plush Yoshi yes. Amiibo. That yes. really is adorable. Then you also have like, essentially fighting for second place, both uh, Disney Infinity with its well-designed um, figures of familiar brands and Skylanders, which is just good designs right yeah. there. Good hefty figurines. You could probably do some damage with it if you accidentally <laughs> stepped on it. Lego, on the other hand, they're just minifigs at the end of the day. And like, and sure, people like collecting minifigs, but like the other figurines, you could actually proudly display them on a wall. Mm. The minifigs that come with this game, they're not that distinct from the other tchotchkes that you have at your desk, for instance. They, they can still pull in like the established yeah. Lego collectors, and s people that would really want to collect them all and mm. have that sort of display uh, on their mantelpiece or whatever. Yeah, and like, and you. You, they go deep into the licensing with this one. So you have all sorts of minifigs now at your disposal. You've got your Homer, you've got your Marty McFly from Back to the Future, you have Shell from Portal of all things. And you know what, something I didn't mention in the review, like the Portal um, level in LEGO Dimensions is probably one of the best of the game because like it is just good design, good integration of the brand. Here I am selling ever so corporate. Yes, they have good source material to yeah. pull off though. <laughs> they can yeah, go, they got, they got, yeah, let's make some puzzles like Portal. Yeah, they got Alan McLean in, like they commit to the bits, which yeah. is good. Um, but that's it for this week. We um, we do have some PAX panels coming up. You're yes. going to talk about one. Yep, last time I talked about a quiz panel, which is on Friday night. But on Sunday from 12.30, Jason and various other Japanese gaming aficionados gathered together to talk about the changing state of Japanese gaming. That's Sunday, 12.30 in the Gala Theatre. Thank you, Donald. We'll wrap it up for this week. So visit our website, www.newgameplus.tv. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash newgameplustv. Follow our Twitter and Instagram at newgameplustv. And follow us on YouTube, we are uh, on New, New Game Plus TV on that for various videos and live streams. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Tim. We'll see you guys next week.